Good evening. Welcome to the American Academy of Cranial Facial Pain webinar series. This is Shab Krish. I'm the host for today's webinar. AACP holds webinars on the second Wednesday of each month. These webinars are recorded and are available for access to the members of AACP. If you are not a member, no worries. You can join our academy by going to aacfp.org. You will be provided with one CE credit after you fill out a brief survey following the webinar. The AACP also has several webinars and meetings through the year. Last month, we started a pediatric OSA mini residency led by Drs. Kevin Boyd and Darius Logmani. We are now looking forward to a hands-on session to be held on March 27th and 28th in Chicago. An exciting opportunity is av available to us when Dr. Rada abdul Fatah will lead a two-day course on April 17th and 18th in Dallas. This topic will be how to document and present TMJ injury cases as well as other dental procedures to avoid those million dollar malpractice suits. The good news is that there'll be a $200 discount for early bird registration. So be sure to sign up sooner than later. We also have a new and improved mini residency on TMD and sleep disorders coming up and a dissection course in the works as well. So stay tuned, we got big things coming our way. As always, to get more information on these courses, go to aacfp.org and click on the tab events and messages. I'm sorry, events and meetings, where you will find more details on this course and a registration link. Finally, save the date for a 35th annual symposium to be held in Spokane, Washington from August 6th through the 8th. We look forward to seeing you there. So let's begin with the webinar tonight. Our presenter is Dr. Bruce Barbash, a prosthodontist who maintains a full-time practice in Dallas and his practice is limited to dental implants, restorative, cosmetic, dentures, and dental oncology. He actually co-founded the Dental Implant Program at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He's a personal friend, and I call Bruce a prosthodontist extraordinaire because he can make everything work. So I'm very honored to have him here as a speaker. So this is Dr. Bruce Barbash. Thank you for that nice introduction, Shab. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to present to your group. As a prosthodontist, I feel that we have a lot in common. We both treat patients with very complex problems that require unique solutions on an individual basis. And for the most part, the patients are very appreciative of the help that we're able to give them. Tonight, I'd like to talk about um, a subset of patients that I'm sure that all of you see in your practice, people with um, the worn dentition. And inherent in managing a worn dentition is managing vertical dimension of occlusion. Etiology of occlusal wear, um, occlusal parafunction, high bite force, chemical erosion, sleep disordered breathing, acid reflux, and xerostomia in our uh, 
head and neck cancer patients and also patients taking a lot of medications. And as all of you know, um, sleep disordered breathing is now being implicated in both attrition and erosion. Um, some slides of um, typical presentations. Um, this is an attrition case, a high bite force case. Look at the uh, large mandibular tori, the expanded maxillary alveolar ridges, and the deep anterior overbite. Um, chemical erosion case, this was a, a xerostomia patient secondary to radiation therapy for a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, long-term survivor. Um, this is a case that has it all. It's attrition, erosion, um, signs, of, uh, signs of GERD, as well as occlusal parafunction. Um, unique patterns of wear, um, certainly suggestive of chemical erosion, um, if you look at the occlusal surfaces of the mandibular posterior teeth, and she's also quite worn on the palatal surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth. So certainly in her case, one of the components I would think is her sleep position. All right. I think it's it's pretty obvious to every dentist that when we manage a patient with a worn dentition, there's going to be a consider there's going to be a consideration of how to manage vertical dimension of occlusion because there just is not any space for restorative material. Um, we also manage vertical when we deal with edentialism, making dentures, implant prostheses. And of course, in tumor resection, I've been involved in jaw in a day for the last few years, and we have some interesting opportunities there. Um, typical dental scenario, patient breaks um, a maxillary lateral incisor, goes to her dentist, dentist refers to the oral surgeon, um, oral surgeon's been in our SPEAR study group for several years, and he realized immediately that there is no room to replace the, uh, the broken lateral incisor, and that the patient has a worn dentition with a deep anterior overbite. So he referred her over to me, and... Um, we did a limited treatment to provide restorative space. We were able to restore the posterior dentition on just one arch bilaterally. And that is um, adequate to provide enough space for a crown. I mean, not an ideal situation, but there were financial constraints. Um, very common now is the teeth in a day procedure where we make a plan as to how we're going to manage vertical and we execute that during the surgery and the fabrication of the temporary hybrid prostheses. Jaw in a day, tumor resection. This is a patient with a large ameloblastoma of the mandible requiring a total resection of the mandibular body. Um, these cases are virtually surgically planned, and we make the temp hybrid prostheses on medical models. And for those of you not familiar with John a day, um, in short, the um, using a, a pre-planned surgical guides, implants are placed into the fibula, fibula is cut, and then a temporary hybrid prosthesis is looted to the implant cylinders and the entire fibula, blood supply, and temp hybrid are transferred to the mouth. 
Um, this shows the medical models that we that we use to make the temp hybrids. So of course we have an opportunity to be very inaccurate. We don't account for the layer of soft tissue um, associated with the bone, nor do we account for the soft tissue in the TM joints. So we oftentimes uh, make some pretty good good errors. So this the fibula is now in place, and the temporary hybrid is in. And in this case, we've um, we've really overopened her. She in fact cannot bring her lips together. So I've had to work for um, quite a while to solve this problem. Regarding the worn dentition and attrition patients, patients with the high bite forces and the occlusal parafunction, the common denominator with them seems to be a low FMA or Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. That is the angle that is made between Frankfurt horizontal and the mandibular plane. The lower the plane angle, the higher the bite forces. And these people typically have square face forms, large masseter muscles, and are able to generate up to two to 3,000 PSI biting force in the molar regions. Um, this is a VA patient, so he was treated around the time of the introduction of the UCLA abutment, which was around 1990, and we were very happy that we had um, replaced his entire dentition with screw-retained implant fixed partial dentures. Well, it didn't take long for this square-jawed individual to um, just break everything. And it wasn't that he broke the prostheses, he actually broke the implant fixtures because as you know, UCLA abutments do not utilize an intermediate abutment. Um, again, these type of people, the low FMA people with the high bite forces, the large masseter and buxeter, Buxiner musculature, um, sheer porcelain, and break plastic. It just goes with the territory. So over time, I've developed treatment philosophies for dealing with these. And essentially, it involves the use of as many monolithic materials as I can to restore to restore the dentition. Um, I've been taking um, courses out in Arizona with the SPEAR group um, since we started our study club several years ago. And it's interesting to me that um, th what they present are basic prosthodontics. And Pretty much everything that they present is in the books that I'm going to uh, mention now. Um, Fundamentals of Fixed Prosthodontics by Herb Schillingberg and Company is just a great starting point. It covers everything, um, preparation design, articulation, um, beautifully written and uh, very easy to read. Um, essentially, Spear teaches Dawson, and his classic book was Evaluation, Diagnosis, and Treatment of Occlusal Problems, um, and they're very big on using Lucia Jiggs. Well, go to his textbook, which was written approximately 50 years ago, Modern Nathological Concepts. Um, telescopic periodontal prostheses, the work of Morton Amsterdam at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Amster Amsterdam developed techniques for splinting teeth with compromised bone and soft tissue support and utilize and achieving long-term results with 
both fixed and removable prostheses. Um, some of these concepts are being have been incorporated into the world of implant prosthodontics. For instance, Astra's CONUS. And I think that as time goes on, materials will be developed to utilize this knowledge. Um, oftentimes, implants are not the best or most practical solution for patients. So preparation design is important. And then, of course, the shot heard around the dental world that changed everything was tissue-integrated prosthesis, the work of P.I. Branamark. All right, the first patient that I would like to talk about is a lady that came to me when I started my practice in 1987. Um, she had consulted with the chairman of fixed prosthodontics at Baylor Dental School a good number of years before before she saw me, and he told and he told her that you know she needed a full mouth a full mouth treatment, and how much it would cost. So she got over the sticker shock, saved her money, and a few years later came to see me. So, you know, pretty typical presentation, you know, overclosure, loss of vertical dimension, um, TMD problems, which don't help, um, and just a severely worn dentition. So pretty much, you know, she's got it all. Um, she's a chemical erosion. She's got some eating disorder. Um, she is actually a high FMA patient, so it's not the uh, parafunction. I mean, she probably just eroded everything. And so, of course, we've got to start with how are we going to manage the vertical dimension of occlusion. My philosophy is to mount the study casts on a semi-adjustable articulator, open the pin adequately so that the technician can wax in an occlusion, an occlusion on both arches and also achieve reasonable incisal edge positions of the anterior teeth because cosmetics pretty much determine how you're going to do your restorations. Um, now, as far as um, obtaining centric relation, the patients wear the splints that are fabricated on the initial study casts. And I have them wear them for four to six months just to make sure that they, can, four to six weeks, just to make sure that they are okay with um, having the vertical open. And it's very rare that anyone really complains. In fact, most of the time they say things feel a lot better. So these are essentially heat polymerized acrylic for the either maxillary or mandibular occlusal deprogramming splints. And in the course of wearing them for four to six weeks, they seem to find a good treatment position that for a lack of a better word, I, I will call centric. Now, just for completeness, there are many techniques for um, establishing a centric record or a treatment position. There's the Dawson technique bilateral, there's the leaf gauge technique, there's the Lucia jig, and then there is the appliance therapy. I am mostly using a combination of appliance therapy and Lucia jig. All right, so this is the guard or deprogramming splint that the patient wears for four to six weeks. So we've established both VDO and our treatment position. 
So at that point, we begin our diagnostic waxing and fabrication of temporaries. So we're at, this is actually a different patient and we're showing a rather complicated technique to make temporaries, but I've had the same technician doing it for 33 years and uh, this is what he likes to do. Um, it's a very precise technique, um, but he will essentially wax the case and prepare duplicates, do preparations on duplicate models. And these, the wax ups that he does, he invests and he processes them with heat polymerized acrylic and makes acrylic shells for me. So this, now we're back to our original patient. These are the acrylic shells for the temporaries that uh, we will be relining at preparation appointments. So in this case, in this patient, we're just going through all of his preps and all of his work, so we'll go through it fast. All right, so we've now got the temp shells ready and we're beginning and we're ready to treat. So I have the patients come a night before their, their morning appointment and I put, in this case, the maxillary deprogramming splint back on the original master cast. These, these heat polymerized splints are um, made on a duplicate cast. So we do preserve the, ma the master. And in this particular patient's case, it was decided that we would restore, we would treat her anterior teeth first. So I connected the splint with a gel bar and remove the anterior section. So I thus have a record of both vertical and centric that I can take to the mouth the next morning for the, for the preparation appointment. So again, this was a TMD patient, so I had to take things slow. I couldn't do long appointments. So we, we temporized the anterior region first and you know it's pretty easy to maintain thing, maintain our relationships um, and then we sequentially went one side at a time posteriorly and did the same and at this point it's essential that you've determined the per, the parameters of the smile and once you've done that you go on. So standard impression making technique. And, you know, I guess you got to realize this is 1987, ceramo metal anterior crowns. And these are her posterior temporaries. And note the uh, long centric, the cingulum stops. This is out of Dawson's book. Um, after the anteriors have been prepared, we did the posteriors, and um, I don't want to spend much time on this, but um, everything is waxed in our lab. Everything is waxed to full contour and cut back. We are actually starting to do a lot of this digitally now. and everything is fit on solid models so that we can uh, minimize our time with proximal contacts in the mouth. Um, this is a finished treatment. Um, she finished with, you know, cuspid rise bilaterally. And all of the patients finish with some type of um, occlusal guard for the evenings. Um, it's either maxi maxillary or mandibular. I've noticed over the years that many people um, just don't like them. So I've some on some patients, I will use vacuform type guards for either one arch or both arch. That see that seems to be well tolerated. 
and just completed case. All right, so this is how she started. And this is how she finished. And this is where she's at 33 years later. Um, she lost one of the abutment teeth for her fixed bridge. So we were, we're now into the age of dental implants. So we routinely uh, replaced those teeth. And as you would expect, she uh, she's had some gingival recession, but her hygiene has been extraordinary. And these are not the kind of patients that you can just treat and say goodbye, or even send them back to their referring doctors without uh, giving it a lot of thought and talking to them about it, because these people do need to be carefully followed. Um, the next few cases, I want to do current technique. Um, I'm not really doing very much uh, porcelain to gold anymore. Um, I'm mostly doing lithium disilicate or Emax in the anterior and the premolar regions. I still will use some ceramo gold first metal you know, in the first molars. And I like to uh, use ADA type three gold in the second molars if the patients will consent to it and it's not in an aesthetic area. Porcelain veneers have really worked great for me. Um, and I mostly use them in the mandibular anterior region. Um, I've also now slowly started to incorporate zirconia into these treatments in the posterior re regions. The advantage is it's a hard monolithic material. The disadvantage is the looting materials do not, they bond great to the teeth, but they don't bond particularly well to the actual zirconia crowns. And at Spear, um, I've learned to um, use compot to actually make composite crowns. Again, situ situational use. And I've incorporated them into some rather large treatments. Um, Okay, more modern case. Um, patient um, noticed that her teeth were wearing and um, restorations weren't staying in anymore. And she was no longer happy with her smile. And again, look at the facial profile. It's square, just square jaw, high bite force. But she's got more than that going on. Um, Again, you can just see it on the pano, just the, the, the angle of the mandible. It's a right, it's almost a right angle. Um, all right, documentation of the attrition, and in her case, a lot of erosion. She's uh, overclosed. Fortunately, she doesn't have a particularly deep anterior overbite, um, but she's got severe chemical erosion. And in this case, this, this is an eating disorder. Um, so again, starts the same way. Casts are mounted on a semi-adjustable articulator. Um, and a, an opening is determined that will allow us to wax an occlusion in and patient wears either a max or mandibular deprogramming splint for several weeks after they've consented and everyone's happy we do the diagnostic waxing and in her case her posterior teeth um, were pretty short and her parafunction was pretty profound and I really didn't have a lot of confidence that I could just temporize her whole mouth and stay in control of things. So I decided to restore the posterior dentition first. But in order to do that, you have to know where the incisal edges of your anterior teeth are gonna be. 
So a technique that we've developed is we just make acrylic indexes on the lab based in the lab based on our diagnostic wax ups, and we try them in intraorally. So the, this is just the maxillary index on the mounted cast. And there we go. We try it in. We ask her if this is an acceptable incisal arrangement for the anterior teeth. If she says so, then I know exactly, you know, what I need to do in the where the buckle cusp need to be posteriorly. Um, based on duplicates of the diagnostic wax up, reduction guides, preparation reduction guides are made. And these are some acrylic shell temps. And I think this was a case where the posteriors were full veneer and the, the mandibular anteriors turned out to be um, porcelain veneers. Yes, they, they are. These are the shell temps for that. And again, just the precise preparation by our technicians and Again, we used her deprogramming splint to help us establish both the CJR and the VDO. And you can see that we started by temporizing the posterior dentition on one side. Established, you know, the occlusion with the temporaries. And then at the following appointment, we went to the other side, finished the posterior restorations and then treated the anterior um, in a in a routine manner all right i i hope it goes without saying that dentists that do full mouth treatment should be masters at basic technique. And I'll talk about some of the techniques that I use, um, imp this impression techniques and materials. Um, there's two ways to do impressions, um, conventional and digital. Either way, it involves a lot of attention to detail. And as far as the conventional, I mostly use the hydrophilic uh, VPS materials, Aquacil and Panacil. We're always using custom trays um, in order to insert the trays seamlessly. We use cheek retractors, um, preparation design. I don't think we need to go into this in any kind in any great great detail, but you have to have a picture of the final restoration in mind and make sure that you have enough restorative space to accomplish it. Um, you have to um, work very accurately in terms of marginal integrity and proximal contacts. The technique that we use are solid models and that way I can verify the marginal fit and we adjust the proximals to the point where it lightly holds shim on the solid model and there's usually not very much um, involved in uh, in seeding them. Now as far as attention to detail goes um, I think one of the most neglected things that we see in the laboratory is that there's debris on the on the on the adjacent tooth surfaces of the tooth being prepared so i always wipe down these surfaces prior to making a master impression um, this just shows what used to be the workhorse, which was the porcelain uh, butt margin ceramo gold crown. Um, I think the point that I'm trying to make with these slides is that it's a great help to have a phenomenal technician um, or technicians. Um, 
this is a patient, young patient that came to me probably in the early 90s who was in uh, some sort of a traumatic accident and damaged numbers eight and nine, and he was not happy with the appearance of his teeth. So utilizing conventional ceramic gold technique and custom staining, um, it's possible to achieve this type of aesthetic result. Um, in 2020, it's quite a bit easier to do this because our materials are greatly improved. Um, one of the things I believe every prosthodontist is thinking about is how his case is going to fail. And, you know, with these patients with the high bite forces, delamination of porcelain and shearing is um, part of the game. So you want to do everything you can to minimize these problems. Um, you certainly want to eliminate unsupported porcelain. Um, this is showing a, a patient that had a posterior maxillectomy and some survey crowns based on, I think, two implants and one natural tooth. And this is an old crown. So I'm pretty sure that, well, certainly I had to fabricate these, and I don't remember if I retreated this one, but I know I did not retreat this existing crown. So I did the whole obturator, and unfortunately, there was a shear right over here. So I had to retreat the crown and redo the obturator. So that was a disappointment. Um, all right, so whether you do it conventionally or digitally, and as I said before, we're, we're getting more into the digital wax ups and digital cutbacks, um, but I mean, you need to think about how you're designing your frameworks, whether in metal or zirconia, in terms of managing your proximal contacts and creating the strongest most delamination free designs that you can for the occlusal surfaces um, and this just shows you know how we how we do it with ceramic gold but this would also work for zirconia you could scan this but my guys have gotten so good that they're now just designing this all virtually and just showing some different designs on the cutbacks to preserve your proximal contacts. Um, and again, this just shows an FPD with absolutely the minimum amount of porcelain. And these are the ceramic gold restorations that will last the longest. Um, as far as my armamentarium, it's nothing fancy. I used um, two, semi two types of semi-adjustable articulators, the whip mix, and then Spear got me into the SAM-3. We do custom incisal guide tables as needed. Um, all of our um, articulators have magnetic interchangeable mounting plates, so you don't need very many articulators anymore. And this just shows the, the simple face bow. This is a whip mix, um, the mounting jig. All right. It is essential to partner with a periodontist or a number of periodontists for um, help with, the, with many of these cases. Um, I feel that when I'm treating patients with worn dentitions, I'm living in the world of tiny teeth. And I'm often asking for help with um, crown lengthening. Now, there's two kinds. There's functional anesthetics. Um, prior to the bonded crowns, I was having to do functional crown lengthening 
on a routine basis it just to obtain enough retentive to structure for the restorations but fortunately emacs has helped with that um, situation all right so just aesthetic type crown line fittings that can just come up inherently in these large treatments um, you know we're going to we've, we're planning to do many many restorations on this young lady and i told her that you know if we're going to do all this we might as well put the gingiva of our maxillary central incisors where it belongs so that she can get you know a more pleasing and the most ideal aesthetic result as well as the functional result and you know this is just the reality on these patients even with Emacs, um, oftentimes we have to do functional crown lengthening. Um, so you can see that this is a situation where it's going to be pretty tough to um, achieve retentive individual crowns. So this particular patient was a full mouth crown lengthening. But we do now have adequate length. Um, this is a recent patient. Um, initially, when I saw her, I didn't think that I would be able to preserve numbers 24 and 25, but after um, the diagnostic waxing and evaluating the space, I realized that with a, an aesthetic, well, with both an aesthetic and a functional crown lengthening, that I would have um, adequate tooth structure to retain crowns. Um, all right, another thing that is, I think, in the bag of every prosthodontist is the use of pink porcelain. I got started with it um, doing cleft palate patients. This just shows an, F an FPD patient was unhappy with an old aesthetic uh, fixed fixed bridge and just came in for a retreat and just pink porcelain made a big difference um, but where it's mostly used now is um, in the world of implant restorations um, it became apparent to me in the late 80s that the original design for hybrid prostheses or screw retained implant for large prostheses with denture teeth and acrylic had many drawbacks and one of them was durability especially if it opposed a natural dentition so we used pink porcelain and in this case ceramo gold to uh, solve that problem and just other routine uses of pink porcelain and again it goes without saying that we should be masters of um, basic implant techniques and i don't really want to spend much time on this this is just showing how to um, aesthetically replace a maxillary central incisor um, these can be fairly complex block graphs. The temp FPD was used as a temp, and also another one was made as a guide stent. And zirconia abutment for in individual crown, temps, implant, and this is the type of result that is possible. All right, so we don't really want to talk about this. I want to get into some more of the um, modern techniques. Um, just in a short presentation like this, I don't think there's much time to uh, talk about temporization techniques, but they're all based on diagnostic waxing and they don't need to be near as complicated as the one that I showed individually. This is just a matter of cross mounting casts, dupe casts of the wax ups. Uh, making lab putty indexes and then just doing preparations on the casts and then you can use jet acrylic in a pressure pot and you know paint them with you know rubber sap 
and you can get shells that can be relined intraorally with either acrylic or a bis GMA resin. Um, all right, another case, loss of vertical dimension, worn anterior dentition, and missing posterior teeth. Okay, so this is a, a modern case. Um, again, it's the same thing. It's the low mandibular plane angle, the square-jawed individual. She just worn down her maxillary anterior teeth, um, and she just doesn't have any posterior support. Um, so this is clearly a case where you can open the vertical dimension of occlusion and not you not have to do any crown lengthening and replace the missing posterior dentition with implant restorations. So init the initial step was to place the implants, and then while the implants are healing, restore the natural teeth. These are the temporaries, the shells, and these are the final restorations, the Emacs crowns on the natural teeth, and the custom titanium abutments, and the restorations that are looted to them. I call these screwmentable. I always want to have access to my abutment screws for the long term. And this is the completed case. All righty. Um, terminal dentition. Um, sometimes you have to know when to hold them and when to fold them. And this is an all on four to all on six case just advanced periodontal disease with generalized caries. Um, of course, a strategy is made to restore the vertical dimension of occlusion, and we use an advanced design hybrid with titanium frameworks and lithium disilicate splints. And the final case I'm going to show is um, a full arch maxillary implant case opposing a natural dentition. Again, you don't really need to see much more than the right angle over here to know about the low mandibular plane angle and the high bite force. Um, so in her case, it was decided that um, we would remove the maxillary teeth and do a screw retained advanced designed hybrid restoration pre-treatment and of course we are increasing the vertical dimension of occlusion and she finishes with an advanced design hybrid and in her case no cantilevers and this just shows the uh, the components the lithium disilicate splints, which incorporate gingival porcelain, the uh, gold-plated titanium framework, and these are looted with um, Ivoclar implant hybrid cement. And intraoral view, smile, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbash. That was a very informative presentation. So if you have an, you can send me an email if you have a topic or speaker in mind. My email is my name, shab at krish.com. I look forward to your emails. And mark your calendars for our next webinar, which probably will be in April. And Dave Shirazi will be presenting a topic on combining oral appliances and CPAP for sleep apnea. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a very happy Valentine's Day.
Thank you.